The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. All right, I think we're at 11 o'clock and this will be the second part of our ACI 376 session to introduce you to the design and construction of concrete tanks for re refrigerated liquefied gas containment. Most of us used to say RLG. I'm Charles Hanscat, incoming chair of uh, ACI 376. All right, with that I would like to introduce Dr. Uh, Nevin Kristolvik Opera, and he's going to be talking to us today about uh, construction performance requirements. And as the co-moderator, I told him he was going to have to introduce him himself. So one of his first slides will be the, the background, the history of uh, Nevin's career in the LNG, RLG business. Let's see. And you should be good to go. Very good. Thank you, Charles. Uh, is it moved here? Oh, here it is. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity to talk with you. To, to present to you what used to be ch Chapter 4, and is now Chapter 6 of performance criteria. Before that, I am obliged to tell you who I am. Uh, I am the outgoing chairman of 376. I am also work with Exxon Mobil, and I'm a senior structural engineer currently lead on the Barton project in Qatar. I also am chair of the 544E, the mechanical properties of our company, in the second area of our company. Now that I have influence 11 years as a university professor, and the last 10 years as a leader of various forensic investigations, uh, offshore structures, from the type of energy, 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 concrete, platforms, and so forth. Uh, my interest in moving beyond the current energy of concrete, the ACI 376. I also work in the development of smart structures, using shape memory alloys, as a fiber concrete, and using safety persistent design as well as traction mechanics of the products. My talk today will be, as I said, about Chapter 6. I will not go over all the details of Chapter 6, but I'd just like to highlight the main points that we cover in Chapter 6. So I'll divide the presentation into some basic introduction, and then I'd like to talk about performance requirements in construction material requirements, and finish off with some other additional requirements. The key difference is really the performance requirements we are asking the structure to behave in a specific manner. In what I term is construction requirements and we are asking you to use the material to very specific properties. Another uh, point I'd like to make here is the overall philosophy, the best, best and standard philosophy for the risk of oil and gas projects. And that is the following. We have the air tank and we have the other tank. Both of them, of course, have to, have to maintain the structural integrity, and our inner tank must maintain the outside liquid piping that means forever it has to maintain the product the liquid. Then, however, as in other words, we don't need them. However, the outer tank, if the inner tank keeps the LNG forever, the outer tank should never experience the LNG. We assume that it's not magical before it, it actually experiences the spirit. This is the belt and suspenders. You basically have both the inner tank that can not rotate, and then the outer tank that can move the liquid in a case of inner tank that disappears. And at that point, you of course don't expect that liquid to stay forever in that tank. What you want is to keep the liquid in place until you have time, a couple of weeks, to uh, empty the energy after this day. As you have seen before, we are the product of NFPA 59H's request for something from ACI that is better suited for a genetic environment. So really what we did is we looked at what, is, what exists in ACI 
ACI and then reference ACI 352372 and 373, and then added additional requirements to make those concrete elements work under carbonic environmental conditions. And uh, as I've indicated the slide before, we can basically two types of requirements performance of requirements meaning how do you want your primary tank, and this is only for concrete tank case, how do you want your secondary tank to behave, and how do you want to move to behave. And then for construction requirements, we really talk about materials. We have some specific requirements for concrete and shock rate, coatings, as well as we briefly touch up on metal components. The requirements also can be classified in a different manner, and that is the requirements are of strength requirements, as well as serviceability requirements covering tracking issues, deformations, deterioration of the conditions, vibrations, and leakage. Let me talk now about the, uh, about the performance requirements, and there are basically three groups. Uh, the question of liquid tightness and so-called containment, the crack limits, chapter 6 defines and also the issue of sliding and slushing and related performance. I want to emphasize again that we're really talking about two things, liquid tightness, primarily in a tank, meaning you can keep that liquid in place for a long period of time. And then we talk about container, when you stay in guns, everything goes to pieces, so to speak, you still want to keep that liquid and prevent it, prevent it from spilling out uncontrollably. Now this table is a, is a little bit complicated, but it's really the only way I can think of putting these issues together. What you can see here is these columns here are what we require for primary or inner tank when it's made of concrete. <coughs> and we talked about this behavior at the empty and operating conditions. We focus on liquid tightness. Under the so-called safe shutdown earthquake, this is an extreme earthquake, the infrastructure has to survive, but as soon as you facilitate and be devastated and you're really shutting it down, then we talk about containing capability during the short event. In the case of secondary, we assume that your primary has already failed, and really this is the case of the safe shutdown earthquake, and you really want to make sure that you're holding that stability. So how does it look like? Under the energy condition, the only thing you need to worry about is making sure that your precursor is efficient, that you that the resultant force is a compression. Once you load it, and during normal service conditions, as well as what we refer to as OBE, operating basis earthquake. The earthquake the facility works through what we have, and uh, the operation doesn't stop. Here, we talk about liquid tightness, and the way we talk about liquid tightness is really that comes from my experience with some other banks and other structures. You want to make sure that you have enough concrete in compression that is there, making liquid, liquid, preventing liquid from leaking out. How much of it is enough? In the previous experiences, from other areas, as I said, what you need is the half of the wall thickness. It has to be in compression. Compression zone has to be at this half wall thickness but certainly not less than 10 inch, inches. And also the compression zone must have at least minimum 145 psi average compression. As we keep on going, and now we talk about extreme event, you can see that the amount of concrete you want to be present is less, it's about half than before, and that should assure that you have maintaining capability in the case of your experience in most severe conditions. And if we have a skip, uh, in this case, really, another thing we're concerned is there is some seepage of the product, but the main thing is maintaining most of the product in the tank. You can see how the amount of the concrete in compression has even further decreased to not more than three and a half inches. And again, there is a requirement of the minimum average stress in that compression zone. Now, the uh, topic, as you can see here, very important thing is how deep is the compression zone, in other words, very neutral axis, which leads me to another issue. And then when you calculate the neutral axis, you, what do you do with the part of concrete that you mentioned, any company or not? Code does not allow you to company to mess up the pressure of the concrete. Unless, and this is what we often do, we allow you that if you can demonstrate that the concrete has never cracked and that in other words it has to up capacity, then you can use the tense up capacity. However, the burden is on you to demonstrate that the tense up capacity is still there. You have to consider everything that actually went through. You need to consider all the nodes, transient steady state, cool down, hydro test, everything else that happened to that section from the moment it was born, so to speak. The 
entire product of performance requirements in terms of crack weight and can give you two limits. One of them is under normal design only, except for wind. You look at the slab wall and roof, and at this point you need to demonstrate that your crack is not bigger than uh, 12 thousandths of an inch. Now, one thing we need to remember here, even though they have no pressure loads from the liquid, etc., there's bending involved, the thermal effects create bending and tension. For instance, there is heat loss of the slab, meaning you have no uniform temperature gradient to the slab, which also gives additional tension and forces you to look into this crack. In the case of spill, we talked about thermal quantum protection area, and that the only area I'm concerned with in terms of crack rates, the maximum crack rate is 8,000 of an inch. And that is when you spend a little bit more of this particular issue. First of all, for those of you that haven't designed this max, let me give you a brief crush course of what the thermal quantum protection is. We are looking at the connection of wall and slab, and this zone here being fixed is already starting high and lower below such as pre-stressing loads. If you now throw at the high thermal gradients, the high thermal tensile forces, usually this section will not survive. For that purpose, you want to protect it by insulation that's in this zone, and insulation is protected by 9% anyway. So that keeps you joint region aligned under the two conditions. However, you want to make sure that while you protect, put everything in place here, that the liquid doesn't creep around until it comes to your highly sensitive region. In other words, what I'm talking about, you want to make sure that this embedment zone is properly designed and the cracks that eventually develop here are not large enough that we need to leave each other product. And that is what I said. This is we have to consider the complete temperature time history and that leads to the limit of 8,000 um, of an inch. And we provide some guidance how to design this, how to calculate the cracks, but that's beyond the scope of my today's presentation. The third requirement of the third group of requirements, of performance requirements, is regarding the tank and what happens to it when you load the safety. What happens if you recreate waste inside the tank and the movement of that liquid can either push the tank side, in which case you want to make sure you have enough friction or you use anchorage. And the second issue is you create waste that you want don't want to you want to make sure you don't uh, pour over the lip of the tank. And the requirement in this case is that the sloshing under the ordinary sorry, operating basis earthquake is at least one foot below the edge of the tank. In extreme level of SSC, you permit the wave height to be equal to the edge of the tank height. So, so much about how the tank should perform. The other group of requirements are what I would call construction requirements. And uh, I'll give you a general uh, point about what happens to these materials and then we look into how do we limit them for concrete, shotcrete, steel, liner, and uh, other metal components. One thing that happens to concrete is very unique, and that is that actually concrete gets better in the decreasing temperature. So if you look at the compressive test results, and you're looking what happens between, by cooling between 20 to minus 170 degrees, uh, you can see that with the temperature, the strength increases the temperature, and as a matter of fact, the optimum strength does not increase. So it's good. You concrete it better. Furthermore, uh, the response also depends on how much moisture you have in the concrete. And you can see that if you have less moisture, that is a dash line or more moisture, strength increases and increases the moisture. So what is my point here? And the most conservative choice is to use the property of material at room temperatures. Second thing is, you really, if you try to rely on this improved behavior, it's very hard to determine because it depends on numerous factors. And that is why we want you to use room properties for the carcinogenic design when it comes to concrete. The only difference is, if you talk about the strength deformation, that increase in the thermal coefficient alpha, the carcinogenic temperature is higher, we need to higher stress, and that's why you must keep that number. Not only that, once you design a finish and you start constructing your tank, you must confirm that number. You must confirm the actual concrete thermal coefficient thermal extraction by testing. Other concrete requirements are the requirements for pre-stressing. The area I link here directly to 318 for all the service loads. The only slight differences 
or in the increased stressing leading to transfer, we went to 37 to 373, limiting this to 0.25 and 11.6 for 318 development. Uh, further, the requirements about concrete behavior is under operating conditions first rate, when you tank walls and the rest of the tank starts going inside static type of behavior. And in that case, under free stress and total load, you want to be section last. The reason for this is meaning if you have seen the main uh, thing helping you to retain it is an unfair concrete compression. So if you open one side, the crack will naturally open. In the next cycle, that side will close. You want to make sure that that side can fully close so you have your protective compression zone keeping the liquid in. And that means practically that you want to keep your compression sections less than 85 at prime seamless, as you know, most of it is linear, and you have a similar limit for the tensile stresses. I do want to point out there was a type in my hand out it's a 0.75 here. And in doing so, you have to use your under section and you would allow the open pre-section process to assure that you leave the second side is boundary conditions. When it comes to shock rate, there is nothing new. You just reference the average of the codes. And this is 506, 350, 372, and 373, and I will not talk more about it today. Uh, one other area that is covered by the type of the nuclear requirements is C. There are three types of steel that we use in concrete, in a pre stress concrete tanks. That is the so-called carogenic bars. These are special bars that retain their properties, their activity, and their strength and carogenic temperatures. And they are very expensive, so we try to avoid using them. And we use a lot of non-carogenic green bars. We usually try to not count on those non-carogenic green bars because the activity will lower the increasing temperatures. However, in a case you do need to use you don't have any reinforcement, you significantly limit the stress that you allow to use. If you use more restrictive, allow the stresses, it is covered in injective material, so I will not talk more about it. And these lower limits are based on achieving the activity and toughness requirements uh, under the cryogenic conditions. The third type of all this thing is the pre-stressing speed. Pre-stressing speed has a very good property, so they don't change the cryogenic temperatures, and therefore, you just reference for the requirements of the cryogenic, of the pre-stressing panels and cryogenic uh, temperatures. Uh, the other material here that is of significant importance is so-called liner. What the liner is, is imagine it's a balloon that is stuck to the outside of your, of your tank. Its primary purpose, or it has two purposes, it has to prevent vapor getting out, and also it has to prevent the moisture that is condensate getting in your tank. And this is what you worry about as long as you don't have a spill. When a spill happens, you assume that this line will be destroyed and, and will not be functional anymore. The code allows you for two types of liners. The most common one is metallic, it is carbon steel, which is the set when you spill that and you need to fall apart. But we also use, allow you to use non-metallic liners. The metallic liner it's handled in detail through reference to API 620, the FMSQ and R. And we provide a little bit more guidance, guidance on non-metallic liners. What these are, these are the spray liners, the polymeric spray liners. And really this limit you have to not to come from the grid standard. We essentially tell you two things. Your type of material you select must satisfy the ESTM test of permeability, of water vapor permeability, and the limit is uh, 1.64 thousand ounces per square foot per day. And then, once you put it in place, the escape of energy vapor should be less than 0.33 thousand ounces per square foot each of your tank per day. Naturally, as, a, as, as an application, as in any other uh, layers of spray and things to do in concrete, you want to make sure you try to get out of it. You can the price. It doesn't pay those other metal components. There are various other metal components. For instance, if you use steam to uh, 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 stay in place over for your roof, then you can rely on those components to be part of your load care mechanism. This is, a, in this case, your growth start. We reference KPS 620, allow the stresses, well joint, and well being and well testing requirements. However, we do recognize that there are some special cases that you might want to go beyond those stresses. And uh, we do allow you to use those higher stresses, but you, your, your responsibility is on you to show those 
some minor spalling, it's, it's going to basically increase the pre-stressing compression. You're going to actually raise the compression because you're losing a little bit of your section. So um, that shouldn't be a huge issue. Uh, as Nevin indicated, uh, leakage would be more, much more of a criterion. Any other questions? Was there another one? All right. Thank you, Nevin.